Long before the United States Army arrived in the Sand Hills, people lived and worked here for thousands of years. Indeed, people from many different cultures and countries have shaped the stories of the Sand Hills. Some of their stories are lost to time. Others are preserved in oral traditions, archaeological sites, historical documents, letters, journals, and photo albums. Listen now to the stories of the Goines and Walden families, to the Catawba and the Tuscarora, to the archaeologists and historians. Listen to the voices of the Sandhills. I don't care where you go, it's just sand, and sand, sand, beautiful sand. And as far as it being important, it's such a different area than any other place in North Carolina. And then you can go west and you have the mountains, you can go east and you have the beaches, but if you want to come to a nice hot place, you come to the sand hills. That's our homeland, that's where our people had lived for thousands of years. We. Uh formed a culture and a language and a, and a lifestyle and a world view based on that area and that's what Indian people do. Southeastern region is, at home, is home to a large population of American Indians. These are their homelands, these are their communities and people have been living there for thousands of years. Certainly there's many things that we would be lost forever in history if, if the archaeologists and the anthropologists were not working on these things. We don't have written history, so all we're looking at is, right now, I guess archaeology has got to be used as a, a friend in certain of these issues. Archaeology is the study of people who lived in the past through the excavation and interpretation of the objects they leave behind. Archaeology is one of the few ways we can learn about people who left no written records or oral traditions. Researchers know that people have lived in the Sand Hills for thousands of years. While some Indians farmed around 1,000 years ago, especially in lowland areas where Sand Hill soils are more fertile, most native people used the woodlands for hunting and gathering. Archaeological research in the Sand Hills is especially difficult because the acidic, sandy soil destroys many artifacts that could help us learn and understand more about the past. Archaeologically speaking, we have no evidence that either the Catawba or the Tuscarora uh, were ever settled in the Sand Hills area of North Carolina, but they were undoubtedly using the area for hunting purposes, for trade, for travel, and, and other purposes. In the 1600s, the Tuscarora lived in 15 towns in northeastern North Carolina. During the heyday of the deerskin trade, the Tuscarora expanded their land use southward into the Cape Fear River Basin. The Catawbas were another important player in the deerskin trade in the Sand Hills at the same time. Uh, more than likely, prehistorically, uh, most of the populations would be seasonal occupants of the Sand Hills, perhaps moving down to the coastal areas. Uh, in the spring and summer to collect shellfish and fish, moving back into the sand hills uh, in the fall season to hunt deer and collect nut resources and, uh, like acorns and, and such. And so we suspect that, that land use by American Indians in the sand hills over time was, was probably more seasonal, but it, it never really supported a permanent year-round occupation. Biologists believe that the ecosystem of the sand hills was particularly well-suited for hunters. Longleaf pine is the dominant tree species in the forests, and longleaf pine is highly adapted to the region's frequent fires. Fires during the summer prepare the ground for the seeds, which germinate during the fall. Young plants spend much of their time developing an extensive root system. This allows them to grow up into the canopy very quickly, which in turn minimizes danger to the young tree's limbs in later fires. Because of this frequent fire regime, the forest is very open in its structure. You have a canopy layer and a ground cover layer with very little mid-story, and this allowed anybody that was walking through the forest to see great distances. And these Native Americans and any naturalists or early settlers were able to walk through the forest and see for, for uh, great distances. If fire was to be absent from the system, hardwoods would start to encroach. The mid-story would become thick. And, and less visible. When you walk through the forest, you couldn't see very far. 
and it would be very difficult for anybody that was uh, wanting to uh, hunt game or hunt animals in the forest to have any success. Three groups of American Indians with important ancestral links to the Sand Hills are the Catawba, the Tuscarora, and the Lumbee. At the Catawba Cultural Center, Winona George Hare teaches members of the tribe about their cultural heritage. From the cultural standpoint, we feel like it is extremely important that you know what it means that sets you apart from other tribes. We have a distinct Catawba pottery culture. Um, to think about today the same Catawba River that we can walk down this trail out back of this cultural center and go down and look at, and to think that you would get into a dugout, dugout and paddle down and, and gather clay and come back on that same river with a limited amount of clay and how hard it must have been to, to do that and how proud we can say that it was important enough that, that no matter how hard it was, they continued um, with that tradition. Caroline Saunders, a Catawba potter, is continuing her family's tradition of female potters, having learned the craft from her mother and aunts. Growing up on the reservation, my mother was a potter and all of her sisters, and so if I was going to visit my cousins and playing, uh, my aunts were out there with a the board and they were working, so I just grew up with it. It's hard to explain that inner spirit that you have that draws you to the clay. See, I, I didn't know that until I touched the clay and I started to work with it. And it just, it was like, blood running through your veins and bringing you to life when I, when I began to, to work with the clay. I, I stayed up all night almost to put a, a handle on a Rebecca picture. And when I got the handle, it was two o'clock that morning. If it wasn't for our pottery, we would not be on the map today because our pottery has kept us here. It's who we are. The Catawba pottery is who we are. The Tuscarora are part of the Haudenosaunee Nation, which is also known as the Iroquois. According to legend, the Tuscaroras separated from the Haudenosaunee and eventually settled in the Carolinas, where they lived for hundreds of years before returning north in the 18th century. Sometime around 1710, early 1700s, the Tuscaroras started to notice a lot of uh, European colonists coming over and um, trying to claim the land for themselves. And of course, we didn't like that and uh, got into some conflicts and um, started what was known as the Tuscarora Wars sometime around 1711. And uh, in 1713, the Tuscaroras decided to move back north with their cousins. You know, when you migrate from somewhere, when there's a movement of people, you leave behind your ancestors. You leave behind the people that you buried. Uh, and that's very troubling to Indian people who have to leave their homelands. During the revolution, the Tuscaroras and the Oneidas, being more surrounded by the American colonists, generally sided with the colonists. And if you remember uh, Valley Forge, where George Washington was down there starving, it was the Tuscaroras and Oneidas that carried on their back 60 bushels of corn to sustain them through the winter. Our people have been farmers since. And if you go down and look at the books and the geology and archaeology from the Carolinas, you'd find they're also farmers down there. So they brought this up, and they brought their farming, they brought their techniques up. George Rickard plants Tuscarora white corn which his ancestors brought with them from the Carolinas. You plant as early as you can, um, middle of May, early May to middle of May, all the way up to the end of May, depending on the grounds ready. And my dad would always say, when you hear the Baltimore Oriole, that's when it's time to plant. Usually, we harvest our corn in the middle of October. Um, that's the big. That's the hardest part. You uh, pick it all by hand, throw it into a wagon or whatever you have by means of getting it back. After you harvest the corn. If it's uh, suitable to be braided, uh, you water the husk before you braid it, it's easier on your hands, but when it dries, it hard hardens the braid and uh, it holds real tight and the braid will never fall. 
that's a small braid, but it's essentially what you get when you're done. Many other groups have lived in the Sand Hills region, including the ancestors of the Goines and Walden families. The descendants of these families take pride in their heritage. My name is Helena Hendricks Fry, and I'm a descendant of the Walden and Goins families. And it's documented all the way back to the early 1800s. And as far as the area that we know today as Fort Bragg, it used to be on at least 4,000 acres by my family. The area of Sand Hills is very, very difficult to grow any kind of vegetables, but they did farm. But most importantly, they had a turpentine company. And they, were, and they were the very first ones. And it's written that they were the first, that was the first Native American business. So they farmed as far as for their children so they could eat. And they also spent most of the time in the turpentine business. Eli Walden was my great grandfather. And one of the things that I was always told is that my grandfather would say that Eli did not want to be considered Indian because he did not want to go out west and be forced to go out west. And it's been a secret that has just been passed down from generation to generation. So both groups of people, and that would be the Waldens and the Goins, were considered free people of color. They always lived together. They always lived in the same community. The Waldens and the Goins, and they cannot be separated because they've always been together. They've always intermarried. In 1918, the War Department acquired Camp Bragg lands. All families who lived on these lands, regardless of ethnicity or social status, had to move off the installation. I think even though the family had to leave the Fort Bragg area, that um, Fort Bragg has preserved the home sites there. And uh, they protected it. And anytime we want to go back to visit, we can. So they maintain it. They, up, they do all the upkeep. And, and they're trying very hard to hold on to the history of the area. The Lumbee still live in the Sand Hills region. Their tribal offices are located in Robeson County. They are currently working to gain federal recognition for their tribe, which will give them a greater sense of pride and sovereignty, as well as financial support for health care and education. We settled in the uh, Fort Bragg uh, Sand Hills area basically as a survival mode. <laughs> Where we finally settled in this area was an area of refuge because it was mostly swamps. And uh, once we got into the swamps, the Colonials and Europeans didn't see this as valued land, so this is where we ended up. In 1835, North Carolina amended the state constitution to define citizenship on the basis of race. Non-citizens, including slaves and Indians, were denied rights, including the right to vote, the right to bear arms, and the right to educate themselves. We were pretty much okay with no voting and, uh, and, and not really okay with bearing arms because we needed those arms to hunt squirrels, rabbits, and other game that we were accustomed to doing for survival. But education was the key. We had a few people that had learned how to read and they taught others inside their home, because it was outlawed, inside their homes, how to read from the Bible. So we tried to keep the educational aspect going inside small families. The law changed after the Civil War when North Carolina rejoined the Union. The Lumbee gradually began to regain their rights. And in 1887, a school was established to train teachers for the tribal schools. And once they knew, they knew that once they taught Lumbees to become teachers, then they, we could teach ourselves, educate ourselves. And that was the whole goal. The Tuscarora established language revitalization programs in the 1960s. Students at the Tuscarora Indian Elementary School are connecting with their heritage through an innovative language program. I think one of the things that the, uh, the uh, Indian school uh, and the Indian school curriculum does it reinforces uh, cultural awareness as far as American Indians. So what that does is it provides an opportunity for those young students to be exposed to Indian culture, to learn about their own culture, to learn about other tribal cultures. 
so that when they grow up as young adults and be able to go off to college or go out into the workplace, they know their culture. People need to know who they are and where they come from. They need to know about their heritage. Many tribal members are beginning to use uh, language um, and I won't say fluently speak it, but they're greeting with the Catawba language and um, there's counting. Our kids in our school um, program can uh, do a wonderful job with counting. One word I'd like to talk about to <clears throat> kids in school is uh, the word for a plant called Fault Solomon Seal. And in our language, that word is called Thketnoxawahyox. And Thketnoxawahyox is actually, when you look at it, it means the fox is eating its berries. And what's interesting is, never has one biologist in the world ever made a connection between the red fox and Fault Solomon Seal. And yet this was encoded in our language for thousands of years. To me, there's an unlocked secret in our language that talks about relationships between seemingly unrelated organisms. As each nation or tribe works to retain its identity, alliances develop between different groups and with archaeologists. It's said that the pottery making among the, among the Cherokee um, at one point finally died out when the last native Cherokee pottery maker in the, in the uh, North Carolina Cherokee uh, bands died. And there was a while there when there were no Cherokee potters. But finding that, that it would be of, of interest and of use for the Cherokees to make pottery again, the Cherokees invited some Catawba potteries, potters to, to visit and to demonstrate, whereupon they learned to make pottery again. Some younger generation folks learned to make pottery again but they made pottery in the style of Catawba women. So the pottery, so the pottery styles changed at that point. And it's not until uh, archeologists at UNC came along and brought the uh, most recent archeological samples back into their awareness that they could begin to replicate those traditions that had been lost. That's just one small example, but it doesn't take long. A generation or two and, uh, and the information is lost. Through careful study, archaeologists can sometimes help American Indians maintain their links to the past. Federal regulations require Fort Bragg to identify and preserve significant historic resources. The United States Army created the Cultural Resource Management Program at Fort Bragg to coordinate these efforts. The program is responsible for managing all archaeological work and historic preservation at Fort Bragg. First, archaeologists inventory or survey the area to find as much evidence of human activity as possible. They record locations of sites using GPS technology and enter the locations into a database. Some sites need additional study because of the size of the site or the type of artifacts found there. Archaeologists study the artifacts from these excavations to determine whether the site has historical importance or scientific value. Fort Bragg has identified over 400 of these sites that require further research. Fort Bragg manages these special sites in accordance with federal regulations. When site destruction cannot be avoided, archaeologists will perform excavations to record as much of the site as possible before it is lost forever. Intensive excavations can produce a large number of artifacts that must be analyzed and described in a report. These archaeologists are investigating a site at Fort Bragg where people lived between 1,000 and 8,000 years ago. The Fort Bragg Cultural Resource Management Program works closely with the many organizations at Fort Bragg to ensure that this site and the other important historic properties at Fort Bragg are well cared for and that information gathered at these sites is preserved and made available to the public and future generations. Without these careful efforts, tradition, history, and knowledge of past technologies 
can fade quickly. If I asked you, for instance, how your great-grandmother uh, washed her clothes, or, you know, how would you know? Uh, the technology with which the people two generations back or three generations back did things is a technology that, that more often than not, we're all too happy to leave behind because we have, we have more effective ways, more efficient ways, uh, at least we, we hope we do, we think we do. Uh, so so te as technology changes, we leave the old behind and go to the new quite often. A lot of the traditions, a lot of the customs that have lost are, are, are not, they weren't totally lost, but they're forgotten. Now they're being revived. The Catawba Nation recently hosted its first annual powwow. They invited dancers, singers, musicians, and storytellers from the Southeast to celebrate American Indian heritage. The event sparked renewed interest in tribal traditions. Powwow is a perfect opener for our tribe. We have uh, members wanting to come and uh, participate. They're wanting to learn how to make regalias. They're wanting to um, make one themselves. Um, and they're wanting to learn different styles of dancing and bring other teachers in from other tribes to um, teach you know, different styles of dancing. As the 300th anniversary of the Tuscarora migration from North Carolina to New York approaches, tribal members think back to the trip their ancestors made. What a journey it must have been for our people to leave North Carolina, to leave their homelands and to move a thousand miles away um, to live amongst people who maybe they weren't so familiar with and had, had lost some ties with. And we thought, well, I wonder what actually, where they actually went what trail did they take? And so we started to think about it. These thoughts led to plans, and the Tuscarora people decided to recreate their original migration, walking thousands of miles along the path their ancestors took. So for the last two years, through the help of the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force, we've been able to fund some trips for our youth to get them prepared. And we're hoping that if we start now with high schoolers, that in three years, they will be the leaders of that trip. And by 2013, they'll be so familiar with that trail, just like our ancestors would have been, and be very comfortable to be able to spend a summer, about four months walking from the Carolinas to New York. The information we have about the Sand Hills would not be here without the Army stewardship at Fort Bragg, as well as the careful work of archaeologists. This information has helped maintain the unique connection to the Sand Hills felt by the Tuscarora, by the Catawba, by the Lumbee, and by the Goines and Walden descendants. This connection is still present after all these years. And it's through this connection to the Sand Hills that each group is tied to the traditions of the past and to the future. We've always believed in land, that we cherish family, we cherish land. And through the generations of family, it, it never changed. So the, the, just the fact that I can go where my great-grandparents walked, it, it's very moving. And I try sometimes to close my eyes and pretend that I would, could go back and be walking beside them and try to imagine exactly what it would be like. A lot of times I get up in the morning and I walk around and I, and I try to think and wonder. Because when you think about it, the land itself has not changed that much. It has not. Over the years, you can still almost close your eyes and see the houses and hear the birds.